Amen. Good morning, St. Sabina. I want to thank you for a Bible. Figure y'all got one round here somewhere. We got one left in the church. <laughs> you should go to one of them conservative churches. They don't read them. I'm getting started early. It is an honor to be here with you all, as always. It is my joy to be invited back to St. Sabina Church. I don't get invited back very often to places, so. This means so much to me. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we stand before you unworthy. Here, not because of our gifts, but because of your limitless grace. We stand here not because of our merit, but because of your boundless mercy. It is our sincerest hope this morning to connect with you so that we can go out into the world and leave it just a bit better than we found it. And so now I stand before you, O oh God, hoping to hear a word, not from me, but from you. I have studied, but I need your strength. I have prepared, but I need your power. Silently now, I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see. Open mine eyes and illumine me, spirit divine. Amen. We stand here this morning, St. Sabina, on the eve of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Well, today is actually Martin Luther King's birthday. among other special dates for some people out there with the pink and the green. But tomorrow America will offer its remembrance of Martin Luther King Jr. And as we have come to learn, America's commitment to Martin Luther King Jr. is matched by its commitment to forgetting Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, we shut down the banks, we close our schools, we air television, made for TV Disney movies about his life. Politicians step up and talk about how they loved him. White folk talk about how they marched with him. you would think that he wasn't assassinated. We tell a story of life and struggle and death and victory and celebration that ignores the fact that it took decades of struggle. From April 4th, 1968, when Martin Luther King Jr. is killed, it took decades of struggle of black folk organizing and white allies organizing and sacrificing and struggling and saying that we must honor the life and memory of Dr. King Jr. And even after 
We struggled to get a federal holiday. There were politicians, some of the very same politicians right now who are pretending to love Dr. King and use his memory to beat up on poor people, to beat up on black people, to beat up on brown people, to beat up on migrants. They're using that same legacy that they shut down. Yeah. So our job here is to never forget. We learn never to forget as African people from the Sankofa bird. It is not taboo to go back and fetch that which has been left behind. But we also learn it from the scripture. As we are never to tear down our ancient monument. We should never forget our forefathers and foremothers. For there are lessons in those struggles. And so we come to Dr. King's birthday this year sober, clear-headed about what we are up against. And we have to ask ourselves, what would Dr. King's, not, you know, not what would Dr. King say, but what does Dr. King's legacy have to offer us at a moment like this. Right. So I wanted to turn to Deuteronomy. We begin at Deuteronomy 24 and 14. Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns. Pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. Now, Deuteronomy is often appealed to. It's a scripture, it's a text that people often look to particularly for conversations about marriage. A lot of male clergy, a lot of male preachers love to look at Deuteronomy 24 because it's really about divorce. And all the different ways and reasons that men can do divorce. You don't cook the dinner right. The power, right. You said that like you don't cook. My God. But I deliberately went beyond that, not only to avoid the patriarchy, but also to focus specifically on this question that Dr. King brings us to, which is how do we build the beloved community? How do we build the beloved community? The reason why I begin with the beloved community is because as we hold on to the legacy of King, we often lose the radical parts of the legacy of King. We love to dream. But when we wake up, we're left without policy. We're left without budgets. We're left without organizers. We're left without activists. We're left without will. We're left without people who are committed to creating the world that we say we want to see in that dream. And so, I'm not that worried about the dream today, forgive me. I, I love Dr. King and I love the dream, but we have had six decades almost of people talking about the dream. Yeah. I wanna move beyond the dream and talk about how we build the beloved community. Yes, the beloved community is God's community. The beloved community is marked by Love, not by romantic love or erotic love or passing by love, but by agape love. The type of love that 
God loves us with. The kind of love that we are commanded to love each other with. You see, the beloved community is a community where nobody falls. The beloved community is a community where everybody is cared for, where everybody is protected, where nobody is illegal, where nobody is an alien, where nobody is unlovable, where nobody is unprotected, where nobody is unsafe. That is what the beloved community is because that's what God calls us to be, a beloved community. And that's why we begin in Deuteronomy. Because in Deuteronomy, we learn a few things, things that oftentimes our political enemies and our social and moral enemies don't want to look to. So they, they love the Old Testament. They'll look to Leviticus real fast when it's time to talk about gay brothers and sisters. They love Leviticus when it's time to talk about the LGBTQ community, but they don't love Leviticus, Leviticus when it's time to talk about welcoming the stranger. They look past Leviticus 19 and 33 and 34. They don't understand that to be committed to this text means to be committed to welcoming the stranger, to not rejecting the refugee, to protecting the refugee. And so them same folk in Texas that will use this Bible to justify disenfranchising and dismissing and harming gay folk will then ignore this book and close the book and bring a busload or a plane load of migrants to Chicago and drop them off with no regard for their well-being. They don't love this scripture. They don't love this message. They don't respect this call. They just want to be subjective when it hurts, when it helps their interests. Yeah. Yeah. But that ain't what we about. We about a beloved community. And so when we hear do not take advantage of a hired man or woman who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien. The text uses alien here, not in the way that the right uses it, but they, the, the word is used uh, in, in, in the original Hebrew to mean the foreigner or, the, or the, he or she who is from outside of here. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. The call here is a call against exploitation. That's a call for all of us. Sometimes y'all meet them folk that got a job and will do a job for you cheaper because they desperate or cheaper because they undocumented or cheaper, because ain't nobody going to find out. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Our job is to be good to each other, even when no one is watching. The law is not the thing that decides whether or not we treat each other right. Eyeballs and, and, and working papers and naturalization papers and passports aren't the reason why we treat each other right. We treat each other right because God calls us to treat each other right and to protect each other within the beloved community. And it goes even more specifically, I, I'm going to jump to 19, which I didn't read. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. I want to say that again. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the, father, the fatherless and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That is why I command you to do this. The beloved community is marked by care. We live in a world now that encourages us to get every last drop of money we can find. 
and to fight and scratch and work 80 hours to have that big McMansion in the, in the, in the, in the car in the driveway the fancy vacation. I'm not telling y'all not to live as well as you can within reason. What I am telling you is you can't accumulate so much that you forget those who have been left behind. The, we are commanded, don't go back and get what you think you left when you ain't even need it because you left it. You didn't even need it that bad. If you needed it that bad, you wouldn't have dropped it. I promise you, if you only, if you only ate that one time that day, you wouldn't have left no grapes in the field. If you didn't have enough for your family, there would have been no olives on them bushes. But we have to reimagine what enough is. We have to reimagine what will sustain us and realize that we are only as sustained as the people in our community who are also sustained. That means that we must leave on the vine something for somebody else. What does that mean in real life in 2024? It means that it's not enough for your kids to go to the fancy private school out in New Trier, Illinois. It means you got to make sure that these Chicago public schools are invested in. It ain't enough for your kids to do well. Every single child in Chicagoland need to be doing well. And if Chicago is doing well, then every single city around this country needs to be doing well. Leave the fruit on the tree for others. I know some of y'all don't want to pay taxes. The one day I get a little Republican is April 15th. I get it. They don't give us enough to make giving away money easy. And they make the system so that the richest people in the world pay the least taxes. There are people who literally made a billion dollars last year. There are people who made $50 billion last year. Some of them got tax refunds. Whole lot of them was even, paid zero. Some of y'all paid more taxes than Donald Trump. That's true. He has some deductions for spray tan and... And it's tempting as you go up the ladder to change your disposition. But the, uh, the beloved community reminds us that as we elevate, that we must still support those who have been left behind. There are young people in here right now who go to wonderful schools like Morehouse College. Slightly less wonderful schools like Harvard. And they slip in by the day. And as you get your fancy degree and as you ascend up the ladder and as you make more money and as you grow in strength and power in, the, in society, you can't forget the people who you left behind. You can't forget the church mothers who supported you and invested in you and believed in you and they need social security. You can't forget those deacons who didn't get to get a, a PhD or MS or, or a BA or a BS, but what they did get was some wisdom that they imparted upon you. And right now we got to make sure that they got a living wage when they leave this church and go back to work next week. We got to invest in people because they will invest in us and then allow us to invest in the community. That's what made Dr. King so dangerous. If Dr. King only told black folk not to fight back, if Dr. King had only told black folk to endure the beatings from the bricks and the sticks and the Bull Connor's dog bites, if they had only listened to that exclusively, Dr. King might still be with us today. But Dr. King's legacy is a radical legacy. It is a revolutionary legacy because he followed the legacy of Jesus. He understood that the beloved community was built on truth telling. It was built upon dangerous unselfishness, courageous honesty, and that required Dr. King to tell the truth about empire, right. not just 
the white supremacist apartheid America, but the imperial, global violence of America. He had to tell the truth about that. Dr. King had to tell the truth about um, not just America's war on black people, but America's war on poor people. You see, as we learn in this scripture, the commitment to a beloved community, the, the, the commandments of God dictate that we look out for the poor, that we imagine the poor as not just one of us, but the most fundamental part of us that we must take care of. Dr. King stood up and made a poor people's campaign. And it was the poor people's campaign that makes America say, wait a minute, Dr. King, stay in your place. That's when he became dangerous. That's when the Negro preachers started to step up and say, Dr. King, that ain't what we about. We're about civil rights. The White House closed the doors to Dr. King. He said, stay in the Negro preacher's place. That ain't what we about. That ain't what you should be about. But Dr. King had a moral consistency that said that if we're building a beloved community, it is not enough to just be free. What does it mean to be free if you are free to starve? If you are free to be homeless? If you are free to be a second class citizen? What does freedom mean if you are still unequal? See, that's what Dr. King is teaching us. That's what the legacy is about. It's about understanding not just the importance, but the necessity of creating equality among all of us. As the text says, whether he is a brother Israelite or a foreigner living in one of your towns, it does not matter whether we are of this tribe or of another tribe. We must speak up and we must speak out. Yeah. Now, The importance of that should be marked for all folk, but as black folk and brown folk, it's especially important. You notice in the scripture several times, it punctuates the command, the command by saying, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. What does that mean? It means those of us who have fought for liberation, and who have achieved any success in our struggle for liberation must now work for the liberation of others. It is not enough to say I am black and I got free so I ain't got to worry about my Mexican brothers and sisters. I'm black and I got free so I don't have to worry about my brothers from Guatemala. I'm black and I got free so I ain't got to worry about gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender folk. I'm black and I got free so I ain't got to look to Sudan. I'm black and I got free so I can't worry about Haiti. I'm black and I'm free and therefore I don't got to worry about Palestine. No, the exact opposite is what we are commanded. We got free by the grace of God and that same grace must be bestowed upon others, but it requires us to do the work of struggle, the work of liberation, the work of truth-telling, the work of building the beloved community. That's what Dr. King is doing. April 4th, 1968 is the last day that Dr. King is on this earth alive. But April 4th is also an important date because the previous year, on April 4th, 1967, Martin Luther King walked into Riverside Church in New York and he gave a He gave a speech that he'd been working on. He'd given it a few times before, at least once before that month. But he, he spoke up and said, why I oppose the war in Vietnam. Yes, now you gotta understand, Dr. King was already 
an enemy of the state. Dr. King was unpopular. Four years after being Time Magazine Man of the Year, he couldn't make People Magazine's most admired list. He, he couldn't get a speech at University of Chicago or Chicago Theological Seminary. He was bad news. His own Baptist convention kicked him out. Them Negro preachers huddled up and said, Dr. King was too much. He was too vain. He was too self-obsessed. And that he had ventured from the moral duties of the church. Can you imagine? Morehouse College kicked Dr. King off the board of trustees. They wouldn't allow him on the board of trustees, excuse me. They said that he was a bad influence on young people. They said, they said he'd go to jail too much. Right, like he was Bobby Brown or This is, this is what you're up against when you speak up. This is what happens when you speak out. But Dr. King understood that getting civil rights passed in 64, that getting civil rights passed in 65 was not enough. That as black folk who had gotten the Voting Rights Act, that black folk who had gotten public accommodations, it was not enough for us to collect our olives from the trees, to take our grapes from the vineyard and go back home. No, we had to leave something on the tree. In other words, we had to go out into the world and continue to leave some struggle and leave some solidarity and leave some love and leave some freedom for those around the world who were oppressed by the same system. You see, Dr. King understood that. He said, how can I be a preacher of nonviolence and endorse U.S. violence in Vietnam? How can I tell black folk not to fight back when we get hit? Because I believe in a spirit of nonviolence, not just as a tactic, but as my overall philosophy. How can I say that and then say it's okay to kill Vietnamese who never did anything to anybody on these United States? And then I got to go back and still be unequal? I got to go back and still be an N-word. I got to go back and still can't get a job. Dr. King said, fix what you got here before you go over there trying to mess what you got over there. That's the beloved community. You see, the beloved community don't got no passport. The beloved community ain't got no border police. The beloved, the beloved community is not limited by a nation state. The beloved community is an international global community of people who matter not because they American. They don't matter because they American. You don't matter because you're white. You don't matter because of what your passport is. You matter because you are gods. Yeah. And that's everybody. So I, I can't sit here Calmly, when I watch these preachers, ooh, Lord, Doc. And these bourgeois Negroes who will allow the church to be used as a shield for empire. Yeah. Last week, there was a protest in the great mother Emmanuel AME Church in South Carolina. A beautiful church, a historic church, a church birthed out of struggle, birthed out of the struggle of the African Methodist Episcopal tradition, which is built on saying black folk have a right to preach to the word of God and not just the other black folk. Black folk have a right to full humanity and full participation. Don't tell me you love God and you obey the commandments of God and the word of Jesus and tell me that black folk ain't got the same rights. So the AME church is a church of struggle. And it's also a church of tragedy. We know that Dylan Roof 
went into that church and killed nine beloved saints as they were praying. So I was a bit struck last week when I saw that they opened the pulpit up to genocide Joe. Y'all can get mad, I don't care. And people, as he began to give his campaign speech, some protesters stood up and said, stop the blood in Palestine. They said, if you're outraged by the blood of Selma and you're outraged by the blood that was spilled in this very church, then how about calling for a ceasefire in Palestine since you're giving them the weapons, you're giving them the support, you're giving them the money. Joe, why don't you do something about it? They marched and stood up and got kicked out of the church and people said, we're outraged. <laughs> you know, I was outraged too. Yes, sir. How dare you use this sacred space how dare you use this beloved pulpit? How dare you use this sacred tradition? How dare you use the words of Jesus who overturned the tables in the temple, who was committed to overturning a Roman government, who was committed to speaking out against injustice? How dare you use this space as a shield for imperial war? How dare you use this space as a shield for violence? How dare you use this space as a shield for genocide? Go ahead, Go ahead. The moral atrocity that took place wasn't some disruptive protesters. It was the fact that you allowed the leader of the most violent and bloody empire in modern history to stand in this place and represent a tradition that he ain't got nothing to do with. How dare you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is why I don't get invited back. And so, for the rest of the week, we talk about our outrage at the wrong thing. And by today, they're going to wrap Dr. King up in it. Nineteen fifty-nine in April, on Easter Sunday, Dr. King gave a, a sermon called A Walk Through the Holy Land. Like many people, Dr. King was fascinated by walking through Bethlehem, Nazareth, Hebron, Jericho, and of course Jerusalem. But by 1967, Dr. King had become confused, frustrated. There are many people today, just like Republicans use his legacy, there are many people who will use Dr. King's legacy to say that he supported Israel. And he did. He supported their, its right to exist as a country. He supported the right of Jewish people to be safe and, and loved and protected and have self-determination, as we all do, I hope. But by 1967, after the war of 1967 in June, Dr. King was supposed to go back to Jerusalem. He said, I can't go back because if I go back to Jerusalem, the people in Africa and the people in the Middle East and brown people around the world are going to think that I support what Israel is doing and I don't. He said that Israel had grown smug and unyielding. He was worried. And in fact, he predicted that they would never give Jerusalem back. That was in 1967. It is now 2024, and they still ain't gave Jerusalem back. Dr. King was making a prophetic call, but he was also making a critical analysis. He understood that nothing would change in Palestine, nothing would change in Ghana, nothing would change in Havana, nothing would change in Lagos, nothing would change in Chicago if we didn't do something about it. That's right. And he understood that it would come at a cost. The legacy of the beloved community and the call to create the love, beloved community is not just a call to treat everyone the same, it's a call to do whatever is necessary to create that community.
But as my dear brother said earlier, many are unwilling to pay the cost. Many are unwilling to sacrifice. Right. Yeah. Right. Sure, I, sure, I support good schools. I'm just not willing to pay for them. Yeah, I believe families should support public education, but I'm not sending mine there. Oh, those kids in the inner city, they need mentoring. I'm real busy, though. Nothing will change if we don't do the work. Right now in this city, so many of our brothers and sisters from the other side of the border have been directed here, not because folk believe in the power of Chicago as a sanctuary city, but because they believe that our Mexican brothers and sisters are disposable. They drop them here and then don't drop any resources. They place them here, but don't provide political protection. They drop them here and create a conversation in the news and in the media and all around the community that they are a burden. They're not the burden. They're not the problem. They are our family. We love you. We welcome you. We need you. We want you. We support you. We stand by you. We will be here until the end because you are our family. You are part of our beloved community. We love you like ourselves, the way that God loves us. Please understand that. Please understand that. But family, that means we got to be willing to do something about it. We got to be willing to sacrifice with our time, our talent, and our treasure. But we also got to be willing to stand up and fight the political powers of the day that make this normal. It's not enough to beat up on your local neighborhood Republican. The Republicans and the Democrats have dropped the ball on this issue. The black politicians and the white politicians have not supported our brothers and sisters. Everybody, it is a biracial, multinational coalition, rainbow coalition of irresponsibility and neglect. Yes, sir. So if we're going to be courageous, don't just be courageous against the obvious enemy. Don't just tell the truth against your open enemy. Yes, sir. We got some other enemies that look like us and dress like us and appear like us, celebrate like us, party like us, worship like us, vote like us. We got to hold them accountable too because Jesus ain't have no picks. He overturned the money, the, the money changes in the temple. He it didn't matter. It didn't matter who or what they were about. If they weren't about the kingdom of God, that was insufficient. Come on, Mark. You think as we celebrate Dr. King Day that Dr. King was giving Democrats a pass? You think he was giving Republicans a pass? You think he was giving Negro preachers a pass? He was holding everybody accountable. The beloved community demands accountability from all of us. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna leave y'all alone, man, but listen, listen. We have work to do. We've come so far. We've come so far. But there's still so much in front of us that we must do. We give God all thanks and praise for the journey thus far and all the victories that have been a part of this blessed struggle. But as we move forward, let us use this day to commit or to recommit or to purify our commitment to liberation, not just for individual selves, not just for individual communities, but for our global family, our global community, our beloved community. That is the call. That is our commandment.
That is the will of God. St. Sabina, I want to thank you for welcoming me into your home once again. I want to thank you for giving me time and space. And most importantly, I want to thank you. And I want to thank my dear brother, Pastor Father Flager, for living a seven-day gospel of liberation and struggle and sacrifice and, and service. And so when we leave tonight, we leave in here committed to doing the work of God. We're leaving here committed to honoring the legacy of Dr. King. We're leaving, leaving here liberated in our minds and our thoughts and our spirits to go out and liberate those who remain oppressed, to preach good news to the poor, to release the captive, to heal the brokenhearted, to provide sight to the blind, to do the work that our God commands us to do. And we do all of this in the blessed name of our Father. Amen. 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 Amen.